What's up guys, Belmont here. So, today we'll be finally taking a look at one of the best one-off games ever released. Yes, I'm talking about the stellar Castlevania Bloodlines. And I hope you got to play either the American or the Japanese version of the game, because the European version, New Generation, had a lot of censorship, which we will discuss. Being more than a mere part of some other Castlevania title, Bloodlines brought us a completely custom-tailored game for the Genesis, with original design, a killer soundtrack, and two playable characters in one of the fastest-paced Castlevanias we've ever gotten. It was also the very first Castlevania game for which Michiru Yamane wrote music. Yes, the woman from Symphony of the Night. And there is quite an interesting bit of lore regarding the Morris family and the almighty vampire killer. And I'll tell you all about it. But first, in order to make my channel grow so I can become a full-time YouTuber, I need your help. So make sure to subscribe and hit that like button. Every single bit of help is invaluable. It would have been the easiest thing in the world to simply port Super Castlevania 4 and make the necessary changes for the Genesis to accommodate the Super Nintendo Smash hit and one of the franchise's greatest games. However, Konami took the righteous path and instead worked on an entirely new Castlevania from the ground up. After two minutes of playing Bloodlines, it's easy to see that the team behind it wanted this game to be unique and have a total Genesis feel to it. Not the band, which is fucking awesome by the way. Seriously, if you haven't already, then listen to Second Home by the Sea, it's one of the best songs I've ever heard. In Bloodlines, we get to play as two different characters. John Morris, the father of Jonathan Morris, who we'd later see in The Amazing Portrait of Ruin, and Eric Lecard, a Spaniard who fought using the Alucard Spear, or as it was written in the game, the Alucard Spear. I mean, why did they write it like this? John is pretty much a standard Belmont character, being able to attack in a few directions as well as using the Vampire Killer to hang on to ceilings and reach higher areas, and even a few different paths. He is a pretty straightforward character with no surprises. Think of him as a robust and reliable car. Going through this fast-paced titleism is fun as hell, yielding interesting boss battles with the classic gameplay we all know and love so much. Eric is an entirely different beast, however. Extremely nimble and able to attack in many directions while also doing a spin move with his powerful spear. It's pretty easy to see who has the upper hand between our two lead characters. Eric has a way easier time conquering certain spots in the game thanks to his ability to attack in most directions. And he has another trick up his sleeve. He can somersault by using his spear as a pivot, both damaging everything on his way up and rocketing himself to great heights, yielding shortcuts, safer spots and alternative routes. You see, I barely started speaking about this game and we've already reached one of its points of excellence. In any game where you get to play as different characters, it's imperative that they are distinct as possible while never feeling out of place from the game's main body of work. Imagine if we had another Castlevania title where we also got to play as two different characters and they were classic Simon and Trevor Belmont. Sure, for diehard fans of the series, this would have been cool in terms of lore, but in terms of gameplay, it would be just basically playing the same character with very little differences. And John and Eric are so different from one another that I can almost guarantee that if you enjoyed this game, and frankly I see no reason for you not to, other than not enjoying the genre as a whole, you immediately start playing as the other right after beating it. The first time I played as Eric after finishing John's story, many were the times where I caught myself thinking, oh, so that's what this area was for, or damn, it's so much easier with Eric, or even, huh, so this pure somersault really enables us to pull some clever stuff. Like pretty early into the game, where while John would have to lag it like a bastard in order not to drown during an auto-scrolling ascending bit, Eric was able to climb so quickly you'd literally outrun the screen and have to stand by for a couple of seconds while waiting for the screen to catch up with you or when fighting enemies that would zone in on you from different angles where John has to do the typical Belmont Physics 101 in order to time his attacks and not get murdered by a bird all Eric has to do is pierce the flying bastard in whatever direction he comes in from and all that without having to jump seriously, I love the Belmonts but if this motherfucker had battle ready descendants and they decided to go after Dracula using the Alucard Spear the Belmonts would be out of business real quick and would probably have to start selling used chariots and cars down the line imagine this Driving a Ford Trevor. God damn it, now I want one. I'd pay high money for that. Such distinct and fluid characters are enough reason alone to warrant this game at least two good playthroughs. But Konami didn't stop there. Oh no. Remember how I said this game was custom tailored for the Genesis? Let's talk gore. Not this guy. I'm talking about sheer violence. You see, Nintendo had a very family friendly policy for its games. 
Who doesn't remember Super Nintendo's Mortal Kombat 1, where fighters would let out around 370 liters of sweat at each match? However, Sega did it. From the get-go, one clearly notices that Bloodlines is a much more somber and dark game. Not even 20 seconds into the game, and you see crows feeding on the guts of a zombie. And speaking of zombies, just take a look at their guts all over the floor once you off them. Or the first boss, one of the most threatening looking hellhounds I've ever seen in a video game. There's even an added element of gore. Once you beat him, his mangled carcass will be left on the floor, still moving. And in order to end the battle, you must destroy it. That is pretty gruesome for a Castlevania title, man. You also had hung corpses. There's also the fact that Eric will be impaled by his own spear once he dies, no matter where he is on screen. Man, that's one resentful weapon. Not as resentful as this one, though. Or sacred. And we also had a very interesting variety of enemies, who have all been redesigned to fit the Genesis feel. They all have a much darker and coarser aura about them. Just take a look at the mermen. They look vicious. We also have Minotaurs, a guy who's kind of a sci-fi wannabe, armors with machine guns and even skeletons from World War I. And this changes us right to the game's story, which I find quite interesting for one factor I'll mention in a moment. In 1897, the war between mankind and Dracula had come to an apparent end, as Dracula was flipped the proverbial bird by Quincy Morris, a distant descendant of the Belmont clan. Peace had been restored in Europe, but mankind would soon take the tragic stage known as the First World War. The continent quickly saw itself engulfed in darkness, violence and hatred. And here's where it gets interesting. At the beginning of the war, the Crown Prince of Austria was assassinated. It was later said that a beautiful wraith-like woman had been playing the cards from the shadows. She was Elizabeth Bartley, who, in order to revive her uncle, Count Dracula, had conducted an unholy ceremony which caused the war itself, giving her possession of human souls from all across Europe. You see, I love games that have ties with more modern settings or events. Now, speaking about bosses, Bloodlines brings an interesting variety that's perfectly in line with the game's fast-paced gameplay. One of my favorite bosses is the Moth Woman. It's so beautiful. But my favorite boss, though? The Machine Man you face at the end of the weapon's depot. He reminds me a lot of another colossal Genesis game and one of the top 10 games the console has to offer. Yes, the unapologetically amazing Gunstar Heroes. And a noteworthy commendation goes to the twin faces that stare right at each other. It's a hellish take on the two faces slash face optical illusion. Pretty clever. However, there is one thing I must say about Dracula's final form. It looks kind of funny, you know, it reminds me of ghouls and ghosts. But as usual, you know, just spam axes on him and he'll become faster than Trevor got drunk in the first season of Castlevania on Netflix. He's no pushover though, so be careful. And now, let's talk about the stages themselves. For the most part, they follow your typical classic vein of progression, but that's just in the layout side of things. If we look at their concepts and graphic designs, we'll see a lot of unique and interesting things, like the giant statue you need to break in order to proceed, the aforementioned weapons depot, and even the Tower of Pisa, which you'll get to play around, inside and on top of. And still on the famous tower, there was an added level of commitment and improvement in this specific part. You jump across many platforms, both horizontally and vertically. The first time I saw this, I thought, oh god, here we go, that fits 101. But no, I mean, of course, you can still die by falling, but there's rhyme and reason here. And this goes beyond the Tower of Pisa stage. There are very few death traps, if any at all. And for a classic Vania, that's very rare. And speaking of which, let's talk difficulty for a moment. As quite a few of you know, I would only become a fan of Castlevania after Symphony of the Night came along. You know, the very first Metroidvania. Some would say, however, you know, that Castlevania 2 already had the makings of a Metroidvania, and while I certainly won't disagree with this, this new genre of game was created after Symphony of the Night came along. Exploring, leveling up, and using all of those different weapons felt so good. And another reason for that was that the difficulty was much more manageable. Now, of course, like most Symphony veterans, nowadays I know this game like the back of my hand and will beat it without dying with little to no effort, but it was a different story when I first played it. It was challenging, but never unfair or worse. Cheap. The main reason why I kept away from classic beaters for so long was that out of the ones I had played thus far, most of them had way too many cheap death traps in order to artificially lengthen the game. And that kind of thing never sat well with me, Castlevania related or otherwise. 
However, after I played Rondo of Blood for the first time almost two decades ago, I thought, okay, there may be some good stuff in here. And Bloodlines was among the great classic Vena titles. Sure, it's harder than to say the aforementioned Symphony of the Night for a number of reasons. The level design, the absence of health replenishing save points, you had no healing spells, you couldn't carry food with you, and you had a much smaller array of equipment and abilities at your disposal. But it's still a very well balanced game. Sure, you will die quite a few times, but in a very manageable manner. There will be a few cheap shots towards the end of the game, but dude, seriously, you can count them using a single hand. Oh, and I almost forgot. In Bloodlines, both Eric and John have a watered down but still powerful version of Richter's item crushing. Tap up and see, and you pull an overpowered version of the sub item you have equipped. And another beautiful addition is that every single sub item has been reworked in terms of looks for the Genesis. There's even an exclusive item, the boomerang, which came in to replace the cross. Which one is your favorite? I really can't say which one I prefer, they're both very good. And you also have a signature magic attack for each character. John throws a homing energy stream, whereas Eric says fuck everyone and pulls a massive Omega Destroyer level of omnidirectional energy burst. Those do eat up a lot of hearts though, so be diligent with your sub-weapon usage. All things considered, navigating through each stage for the first time is sure to bring joy and a sense of anticipation as to what's gonna come next. You know, what's the next boss gonna be like? Where will I go next? Or how is this enemy gonna look in this Genesis game? There's even a cleverly designed stage that contains two layers of gameplay area at the same time. Think of them as different dimensions. You'll be constantly shifting through them in a very intuitive manner, making seemingly inaccessible areas possible to get to. Really, I wish we'd see more of this type of thing in games. It's so clever and functional. And now, let's talk soundtrack. As I said earlier into this video, this would be Michiru Yamane's first time composing for the series. The soundtrack always manages to sound spooky and eerie, but never exactly entering the horror genre. There are many songs here you can just rip out of YouTube, load in on your phone and listen on your car. Really, they are amazing. Michiru Yamane radiates elegance with everything she writes. She's a genius. After you're done with this video, look up Simon's theme on YouTube. It's one of my favorite renditions of this timeless song, really. It's powerful, strong, foreboding, and above all, elegant. God damn it, I'd marry this woman. And now, let's talk censorship. For some ungodly reason, the European version of Bloodlines, called New Generation, got the ass end of the stick. Zombie guts? Yeah, no. Dripping blood at the title screen? Mm -mm, no, sir. Hanging half seas of dead dudes? <laughs> of course not. The Blood Fountain? You're so naive. Well, then, what about those birds feeding on whatever's left of good old Jimmy, who passed away probably a few centuries ago? Yep, that's also a solid negative, sir. Now, while this certainly won't stop you from having fun with the game, you know, it's not like Ace Combat 3 where they butchered the whole story and turned a two-disc masterpiece into one single-disc standard Eric Combat game, or Rival Schools where they removed the awesome character creator mode from the Japanese version and only left the standard fighting portion. You know, it's still enjoyable, but I have to ask myself, did they really think that young folks out there would be so weak-minded as to be scarred forever by this? Oh, uh, you know. Oh, and by the way, I have a quote-unquote shitty English version video in the works, where I'll discuss, or should I say bitch extensively, about some atrocities us non-Japanese speaking gamers got back in the day. If you remember any of them, let me know in the comments. If I have the time, I'll look into them and perhaps even add them to the video. Now, I'm not one to make pure slamfest videos, but there are just some situations that demand this. And you know what? In those cases, I'm more than glad to oblige. So, in the end, after all's been said and done, Bloodlines is one of the greatest classic Vanas one could ever hope to play. So much that it made it to my top classic Vana games you must play. I'll leave the link for you right now. Just look up and to your right. And you know what? I have to be honest, man. Castlevania Bloodlines goes beyond just being an excellent classic Vania. As a matter of fact, this game is one of the greatest platformer games in history. Now, for the final verdict. Designed to be a one-off, completely authentic Genesis game, Castlevania Bloodlines shines with personality, high-speed gameplay, well-balanced enemy placement, interesting and fair bosses, beautiful level design, dark and somber graphics, quite a few bits of gore, and two different characters that play like night and day. Not to mention, of course, Yoko Shimamuda's amazing work in the soundtrack department. Bloodlines earns itself a stolid 10 out of 10. 
I hope you had a great time watching this. I sure had a killer time making it, and I'll see you next time. Now get up there and show them what you're made of. Bam it out.